Yeah. All right. Well, we're waiting for this thing to warm up. I am based out of the Madison County Extension Office just down the road in the Lifelong Learning Center at the college. That's where I'm housed. I heard it beep, so it should get to go in here before too long. Okay. Here's a question for you. Who can remember when was, if you give me a month in the year, Emerald Ash Borer was found in Nebraska? <laughs> okay, good. You're going to learn a lot tonight then. So this is what we're going to talk about. Emerald Ash Borer right here. Not a real big critter. We're going to cover the history and biology, so you know, when it got to the U.S., what we're looking at for how it develops and works within the ash tree, signs and symptoms, so things that you want to be watching for uh, with your ash trees, you know, what all is at risk, uh, management tactics. We'll go over that, just like I promised you when you asked me earlier. And really, is Nebraska ready for this? Well, we'll find out. So this insect arrived from China somewhere over 20 years ago. That's what we know. We think it was found, it came in on wood packing material, whether it was pallets or something like that, we're not entirely sure. But in 2002, it was identified from Detroit, Michigan. Since then, it's spread into the Midwest and Eastern states, Southern Canada. Um, one of the newest additions in Canada is Manitoba. They have a single location found there. <clears throat> Recent finds uh, in the U.S. include Oklahoma, Alabama, Delaware, Nebraska, Louisiana, and Texas. Uh, as I was digging around late this afternoon, I didn't have a chance to change it, but they have now found it in South Carolina. So that is one of the newest ones, as well as Vermont. Vermont was a holdout up in the New England area. So here's the native range. So here's China, would be within this red dotted line in this circle area. It's also found on Taiwan. That's where we're looking. And here is the current distribution as of March 1. I was able to sneak this in. So there's Manitoba. And there's the one red dot in Vermont. So you know, all those little red dots represent initial finds in a county or borough. Some states don't have counties. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. So it's widespread. It's across the eastern half of the US right now. In Nebraska, we have three locations where it has been found. So East Omaha, Papillion, and Greenwood. This was the initial detection right here. So this is I-80 as it comes through and out. It'll be right along here. This gray line, it's about two blocks south of I-80 in a park is where they found it. It's so what we originally predicted and what you heard from the Forest Service and the university, we were expecting it to show up along a major artery in Nebraska. I-80 was where we were watching for it based on past invasive pests. When we've seen them come in, that's where they show up first. It's along I-80 because we get so much traffic through the state on that road. This spot down here was at a firewood dealer. They cut and stacked firewood and then would sell it. And so they found it. After this came out, then they started looking and said, oh, wait a minute, I've got something. And I, and I don't know the story behind this one. This one was very quietly put on the map. And we found this, this so this was June of 2016. So I'll answer the question. It was June of 2016. So when you're looking at this insect, it is a half inch long, a bright metallic green, and it's got this reddish copper color underneath the wings. Now, you're gonna have to share. I brought two. We'll start one at the front, and then we'll go to the back. Are you sure? You just wanna look at it early. All right. So you can see those are the actual insects. Those are from Michigan. 
where it was first found. <clears throat> You're not going to be able to see this part because the wings aren't popped open. Hmm, fun. Lovely projector. So this is the larva. It's worm-like, no legs, it's dirty white. It has kind of a triangle or bell pattern to the body. So if you use a little bit of imagination, you can see that there. When the larva is mature, it's about a half inch long, so not real big. And it tunnels shallow, wavy tunnels. So we call them serpentine galleries. So there's the larva. You would have to peel the bark back on an affected tree in order to see that. So if you ever, this word, anybody familiar with what frass is? No? Okay, let me teach you a new word. It's poop. It's insect poop. So one of the sayings among entomologists is frass happens. There you go. Life cycle, right now, we're in this stage right here. This is what we call the pupa stage. It's an in-between stage between the larvae and the adult. The adults will come out from late May all the way through September. And then they will lay eggs. So these are tiny little holes that have been chewed and filled in in bark where they've laid an egg. Those eggs will hatch and then proceed to burrow into the bark and then the larvae will develop and grow. That's, that's where they feed, actually, is on that cambium layer, right underneath the bark. And I'm trying to remember where the spot to show you this stuff is. Yep, you right here is good. Around these trees, or how do you, you don't actually. Sure. Yeah, we'll get into that. So I'm gonna. Are all the tree, I too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get. I'm gonna hold you off on that question because we're gonna get there. So what I passed around here is a single piece. So those galleries going underneath, so that's the bark. You can see on the flip it over, you can see it's the bark. So it's directly under, underneath that transport tissue for the tree. But do other things make this same pattern other than Not anymore? the winding, the tight winding galleries. See how tight these are going back and forth? There are some other ones that will meander through there are, and we'll get into those other ones too. I'm not going to cut you short on that. The host plants for this include all of our ash trees in the genus Fraxinus. So your green ash, your white ash, your blue ash, your black ash, your European ash. Uh, don't have purple ash up there, but it hits purple ash as well. Any of you know what a mountain tr ash tree even is? We have a number of them around town. Have you seen the short, kind of shrubby trees that have the big orange berries on them? I mean, you get blank stairs. That's a mountain ash. There's a, uh, okay, you know where a square tire is? There's that short, shrubby tree right there next to it uh, on that frontage road. That is a really sad mountain ash, and you can see the orange berries on that later in the summer. But it does not attack that. There is one other tree that it will attack. It's the fringe tree. It's, it's another non-native species that grows here. And you have to get into kind of the Missouri River Valley down to the south for it to grow wild. But it is around. So are the ash trees a native of China? No, they're not. So what tree over here is the ash tree? It is ash tree. They have their own native ash trees. I'll show you one a little bit later on. You're jumping the gun on me a lot. That's good. You're thinking. So I pass that around. The larvae feed just under the bark. So they, what they do is they disrupt the flow of nutrients and water to the rest of the tree. That's coming up. The adults will attack healthy, vigorous, or stressed. It doesn't really matter what kind of ash tree it is, what kind of health it's in. They'll attack them all and any size. So if you went back to that map, see this spot right here? That's Boulder, Colorado. And they thought, they're thinking on that one as it came in on 
infected nursery stock. So you're talking a tree that probably isn't more than an inch caliper or so. So they don't take very big ash trees for them to get started in developing on. Nursery stock. So like if you went down to Earl May or Baumgars or Menards and bought yourself a tree from them, there's a reason why you do not see ash trees anymore in those types of locations. It's because we don't, they don't want to spread this around and it's easier just not to sell them. And that was mountain ash? Not no, regular ash. They have a lot, there's a lot of green ash out to the west along the front range of the Rockies. Especially when you go up the river valleys, that's where you find it. So most other wood boring insects attack stressed or dying trees or trees that are already dead. That's what a lot of our natives do. So here you go. Here's the more meandering ones that I was talking about. Look at that. There's the really nice tight back and forth going through. So this is a heavier infestation. And these are a little large to be emerald ash borer. But just to give you an idea of the feeding back and forth. The ones on the left, those are also ash borer or not? There's some. So these big ones are not. Look at these small ones right here. So this one's tree's actually got both going on. There are some borers that will actually go in and out of the heartwood too. Like which one? <laughs> yep. So the habit of attack. So like I said, any size tree, they attack trees in open settings. Um, first, what happens to a tree when it's in an open setting? Any ideas? <laughs> well, sort of. They tend to be lone by themselves. So if you do have something going on in the air, they congregate on that more so than if you're spread out in multiple trees in a non-open setting. So they'll, they'll attack along the trunk and main branches. So they'll start on areas like this, and then they'll move into the main trunk down lower later. It's not the first part, place they start. They start usually up here, which is why it's so much harder to find them until they're established. So here's a Detroit suburb in 2004. You can see ash tree. This one's dying. This one's dead. This one's dead. This one's dead. This one's in the process of dying. After we had Dutch elm disease go through and kill most of our American elms, we went to green ash in a lot of neighborhoods because it grew fairly quickly. It was a fairly solid tree, generally a good shape. So here's a landscape. So this is a wooded area from Wisconsin. All those dead trees in this area are ash trees that have been killed out by emerald ash borer. They can spread. Uh, the adults can disperse about a half to a full mile per year. Firewood, nursery stock, and ash products are how they move longer distances. Why you see a lot of uh, corn tree boundaries now with this particular insect. I mentioned already they don't ship ash trees for nursery stock anymore because of this problem. And then also fresh wood and craft items can be a problem if it's not stripped of bark or if it's still uh, hasn't been heat treated, they can be living underneath the bark. You mentioned I-80, what other transportation methods? Would railroads do the same? Railroads, railroads typically don't carry yeah, nursery stock. Yeah, most of the time lumber is was kiln treated. So it's been heat treated. So you're not, they dry it down. Now, granted, they don't always dry it down all the way or they dry it down really quickly. But that heat and you're stripping off the area of the tree that they actually bore in. So what's being done with getting more stuff imported from China in pallets? Good question. That yep, that's a regulatory piece that I am not well up on. 
There's, there's been some other things that have come through on wood from other places too. It's, it's a continual problem. Yep, that's how we shared some crop insects with Europe. It was most likely through Chicago O'Hare. <laughs> so the symptom progression. So I'm gonna give you a timeline. Time from a tree tack initially to tree death is usually three to five years. So that initial tack, you can't tell that it's there. The canopy starts to thin. But here's the problem. Our ash trees tend to do that a little bit on their own here and there, so it's really hard to pick out whether it's a natural cause just due to the environment that it's growing in or if you've got emerald ash borer going on. Water sprout growth, I'll show you a picture of this. Um, in the later slide, you get a lot of dead branches with cracked or loose bark. They are a smorgasbord for woodpeckers because a lot of the other uh, wood boring insects will go into the wood a little bit deeper. These sit right underneath the bark, so they're easy to get to comparatively. So there's those serpentine galleries that you're looking for, the D-shaped exit holes. I'll give you picture, plenty of pictures of those. And then anytime you get tree death, it becomes a safety concern. Because once that tree is dead, you can start getting structural integrity loss due to other things going on. Now here's second to fourth year progression. So here's second year. Here would be a third type year. And here would be a fourth year. Notice all of these extra shoots, or what we call water sprouts growing off there. The tree is trying to compensate. Here's more. Here's a canopy dieback. Here's a great shot of the water sprouts. So these come out in droves. You might get one occasionally on a tree, but to get this many coming out at once, it, the tree is desperate to try and get more leaf area out because it can't transport high enough up the tree to grow up there, so it's sending it out lower down. So, so you have other parasites that take over like carpenter ants while you know, ash borer is So carpenter ants will nest in dead, rotting wood preferably damp rotting wood. That's what they like to be in. So they're usually a symptom of something else going on. So you'll see ash woods that are dead from the center out, just like mm -hmm. cottonwood. Yep. And you'll see that water sprout and tree on the tree that's older. You know, how do you know? How do you know? Well, you got to look for some of the other signs. This is a good initial sign to say, OK, I got to look at this tree a little closer. The worth, real things you got to look for is you add in, okay, do we have a lot of woodpecker activity going on on that tree? We do have some, we do have woodpeckers around, so they would find it. And then what you really want to look for, here's another one, split bark. So here's where it's splitting off, and you can see all those nice, tight serpentine galleries going through there. This is a nice fine crack right here. It's harder to see. You can see the photographer had to break a branch to get to that. So those nice tight serpentines are what you're looking for. No other insect will quite do that. And the D-shaped exit holes. There's one coming out. So they're highlighted in red on these. So make sure those get passed around because you get different vantages on each of these. All the way through September. So you'll, you'll frost not necessarily with frost these. Frost, frost is not going to touch these guys. You're going to need. It, came out of Michigan, it survives in Michigan and Minnesota. So a, a frost isn't going to do much. The freeze will shut down the tree, which will shut down the growth and development for the year with these guys. So those D-shaped exit holes are what you're looking for. There are a lot of other things that make exit holes in an ash. So you're talking about an eighth of an inch for emerald ash borer and it's D-shaped. I see a lot of ash bark beetle. Those are round and they're half the size, about 16th of an inch. Lilac ash borer is round, but it's a quarter inch. 
red-headed ash borer, another quarter-inch one, but it's oval. And we have, we have all of these three that are not emerald ash borer. We have all those around here. You got another question? Go for it. If you had an oak tree and it looked like the ash bark beetle holes, would that be an ash bark beetle attack oak trees also? No. It would probably be one of, there are a lot of these different kinds of bark type beetles and at borers, and it's probably going to be one that's specific to oak trees. There's a few that also get around on a lot of other hardwoods, like painted hickory borer is a good example that gets into a lot of different hardwoods. But they attack as the tree is dying. There you go. You want the D-shaped exit holes. So I already mentioned, so our native ash borers, they attack hardwoods, but they're stressed, unhealthy, or dying, or dead trees. So here's the eastern ash bark beetle here. Here's banded ash borer. I get these a lot uh, this time of year when we get a cold snap, because people bring firewood in to burn, and then they don't burn at all. And then these things come out. And sometimes we get red-headed ash borer that comes out. I don't see a lot of any lilac ash borer or carpenter worm that comes out inside. But last year, I did get called out to a, let's just call it a country residence, where they were concerned about this particular ash tree. And I'd say, it's good, they called on this one. That you've got the dieback. You get in closer, you've got this, looks like something hit it here at some point in time. And you've got a bunch of stuff coming out. This is that frass that's being pushed out. Right here, this was my clue to what this was, despite the, the size of the holes. I kind of knew what it was already. But what I had was a pupil skin. So this is a carpenter worm. So get back to that picture. That's the carpenter worm that's going to town on this particular ash tree. And there's my thumb. So if you want some size comparison, actually I should give you the left one because that's my watch hand. There you go. So it's almost as big across as my thumbnail, that particular hole in the bark. Did it leave all that residue on the ground? If you're to the like this stuff? Not the picture before it. Oh, wrong way. All this? Yeah. Yep, that's all frass that's been put, pushed out. This particular tree was just riddled with holes. There's a tiny little black ash out in the college landscape, out on the main campus, that's got these things in it too. But that tree is only eight feet tall and in the middle of a grassed area. It's not going to hurt anything if it goes down. Uh, this particular one, because of that barn sitting right by it, I'm like, mm, you're probably going to want to get that thing down. If you've got, because carpenter worm will bore through the heartwood. They don't just stay on the surface. They bore in. So that particular one, this now is a da danger to that structure, especially if you get a south wind, because this was sitting on the south side of that particular structure. He had some other ash trees that had been, looked like they'd been hit by various things. They look kind of like your picture that you showed me. They had fungal growth, but not the coating fungus like what you had. They had actual shelf fungus growing out of what looked like healthy parts of the tree. So he had a bunch of cutting down to do. When we find that, usually the tree, when we cut into it, it's soft inside. They're about this big all the way down. So mm -hmm. Do you work for one of the tree removal companies? I, I have one. Okay. Anyways, you can dig it out with your fingers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's right. So there are a lot of native species that are very closely related to emerald ash borer. So here's emerald ash borer right here compared to the rest of them. So poplar aspen, hawthorn, maple, dogwood. Let's see here. This is the... This one doesn't have an English name, uh, but it feeds on locusts, but it's very close. And here's another one that gets in on poplar and aspen as well. So there's a lot of these out there, a lot of uh, insects that can be confused with. 
There it goes. Which is why you see this. This is the Emerald Ash Bore Lookalikes sheet. You can get this uh, through the Nebraska Forest Service on their website. So there it is, right here. We had, for a while, we were handing out Emerald Ash Bore detection kits. We'd had a postcard with a little snap cap vial on it. And that vial was only about three fourths of an inch long. And we had people trying to cram these things in there and sending them in. So they get it in, and this was smashed and stuffed in there. I also had, you know, in 2016, right after Emerald Dashboard was announced in Omaha, someone found one of these in the West Point area and then threw it up on Facebook, saying, I found the Emerald Ash Bar. And the office manager in our office saw it and said, you need to look at this. And what she had seen was the underside. She, didn't, she didn't, took a picture of the underside, so it looks about the right color. So that's a half inch. This, this thing's almost 3 fourths of an inch. It's a lot bigger. It's a lot wider. And she just uh, turned it over and looked at the yellow speckling on the other side because <laughs> they have some problems. So the, I asked the office manager, who happened to be friends with this person, and I said, okay, could you send them a message? Don't put it publicly on there. Just send them a private one and say, oh, by the way, that's actually a, what we call a poplar flat-headed pour. <laughs> and she very quickly, uh, after looking it up, went, oh, yeah, that's not an emerald ash borer. <clears throat> so when we look at communities in northeast Nebraska, um, in Nebraska as a whole, we're 13 to 20 percent. Northeast Nebraska, 40 percent ash trees in our communities, which is not practicing good forestry. Uh, good uh, community forestry, you don't want to have more than 10 percent of your population of any, all your trees to be one particular species. You want to spread it out. <clears throat> so lowest is down south. Well, down south they have more options sometimes than we do up here. And so Lincoln, as an example, has somewhere in the neighborhood of 160,000 ash trees. Last I saw from the North Fork Tree Board, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 on public property in Norfolk. So the management tactics, quarantines. There are federal and state quarantines. If you look at Nebraska, we have a four county area, Dodge, Douglas, Sarpy, and Cass County. They didn't put Lancaster County in there yet, um, but then again, we haven't had a detection there. They do a lot of monitoring and detection. Uh, so they'll take trees, they'll debark them, traps, uh, biosurveillance with that. They'll remove and replace is a good option right now, especially if you've got declining ash trees, things that don't look very good, or you start the replacement process now, uh, anticipating that at some point you're going to lose your ash tree. Um, there is some host plant resistance in the works. Uh, biological controls also in the works. Uh, I don't touch much on this later on, but I think we're up to five or six parasitic wasps that they've released to the east of us trying to uh, get this thing under control. And that's one of the upsides of us being further down the pipeline on this is that we've had areas like Detroit, who's been dealing with this now for over 15 years, that are trying to figure some of this out for us, so we'll reap the benefit if they can figure something out that will get in place before we get too heavily infested. And then there's the annual insecticide treatment option. So monitoring detection, they will sacrifice an ash tree like this to get it to go. So here's a girdled tree trap where they put uh, a sticky substance around that girdle. There's the debarking to look for them. Has anybody seen any of these big purple traps yet? There's one hanging in Newman Grove. Was one. They should be down by yeah, now. 
Uh, there was one out on, let's see, 49th Street last summer. So if you turned off of 275 and went north and along that tree row on the east side, there was one of these hanging up in that tree row. Uh, about five years ago, there was one hanging off of North 1st Street where right before you go over the bridge to go over, off on that left-hand side, there was one hanging up in there one summer. They move them around, and they are nicknamed the Barney Trap because they're large and purple. Uh, they're still not super effective, but it's the best we have right now. The purple we know is attractive, and it's enhanced by this Manuka oil, which is from a Manuka, or Manuka myrtle in New Zealand. So, there are a lot of trees that are recommended for replacement. Now, these are some of the trees that are native and adaptable, but what I would recommend is actually going to the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. Let's see if I planned this correctly. In Omaha. Mm -hmm. That was that one I was talking about in the park, two just blocks two blocks of I-80. And that particular park had a, uh, if you look right where it was, there was a camp grill or campground grill. You know, one of those ones that they have in campgrounds, it's on a post, it swivels. There was one of those about 20 feet away. <laughs> Iowa, the first detection was up in the Dubuque, Iowa area, so the north um, east corner, and they found it there uh, after they had found it right across the Mississippi in Wisconsin. So Wisconsin right across the river has, but it, there was about a three or four year lag on that. Okay, it's obviously decided not to work for me. Yes, open. Are there other countries in the China infestation? The native infestation in Asia is not an issue. Mainly, what's that? What about Australia or Europe? Don't hear about it in Europe. Um, for whatever reason, it has not gotten into Europe as a problem. Okay, we're going to go about it this way. We'll manually make this thing work. <laughs> Something like that. How many years ago did the Dutch almond trees come there? Late 70s, early 80s, I think is when it came through. It's still around. Kills a lot of um, elm trees still. What was the country's origin from that? That's Europe. That's a European disease. Is it's carried by the, um, let me get this straight. So we have the elm bark beetle, and then we have the, oh, I can't remember the other, but we have an invasive one that's from Europe. And that's what carries it from tree to tree, and that's a fungus. So here is from the, the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. So these are the recommended trees for eastern Nebraska. Where is your arboretum located at? Well, the main one is down on East Campus in Lincoln, Maxwell Arboretum. There are other ones located around. Uh, there's one in Pierce at Gilman Park. There is one, let's see, Skyview Lake is, so Skyview Park here in town is working on becoming an official arboretum. They just don't have quite enough plant sp tree are species trees, yet. So the arboretums are a great place to go, especially the ones that are local, so you can see how they grow in the local environment. A lot of them out of the sky, you have black. Wow. Yeah, and that's another one of their problems. They don't have enough of them marked. No. So they're in the process of working on that. So I, I haven't seen the official announcement yet that they've made it far enough. So they are working on it. Uh, 
with these, there is a, a Western Nebraska 1-2 list, but I figured for this venue, I'm not going to see too many people are going to be planting trees in the western half of the state. So they, they have the big uh, deciduous shade trees. So those are all options they have. Uh, some of the ones that do fairly well around here, uh, Northern Cantalpa does fairly well as long as you're willing to put up with the uh, seed pods that drop. They look like great big long green beans. Yeah. <laughs> well, any, it all depends on how well it's taken care of. It all depends on how well it's taken care of. The site selection is good for it, the soil type. What I will tell you, and what I, I, I asked you if you lived up in the Bel Air region in town, we have some tremendous problems in Norfolk in that Bel Air region. It's up on a hill. There wasn't very much topsoil to begin with, and when it was developed, a lot of that got scraped off, and you're left with this nasty yellow, sticky clay subsoil that's up in that area. And it has a very high pH relative to soil, so it's in the high sevens into the low eights, and you have a very hard time with nutrient uptake. So we see a lot of iron chlorosis in maples. So maples typically don't do very well up there. I get Every year I get leaves that come in, and like, what's wrong with this? And invariably, you look at the main veins on the leaf, and they're still dark green, and then all that leaf area in between is yellow. That's very typical of iron chlorosis. Uh, you can in also run into some manganese shortage issues. But that it's in the soil, but because of the pH, the tree just can't get to it. It's not in a form it can take up. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Oh, that's what this was meant for. Yeah. This was meant to generate that type of discussion and go over it. Some of these you got to kind of watch because um, they do have, let's see, they do have some of these hybrid elms with these, and you got to watch some of those. And they take some pretty vigorous pruning to keep them under control. Otherwise, they get too thick, they get branched, die out, and then you can have some other problems get started in them. So you got to watch those. So out of these, uh, so Northern Catalpa grows well if you're willing to tolerate it. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree gets pushed a lot. It's a really slow grower. And it does produce its own seed pods once it gets big enough. So those are, they're larger and they're kind of thick. So yeah, again, another one that people don't like with their lawnmower. Hackberry uh, generally does fairly well. The one thing about hackberry is you're never going to get a leaf that looks normal because of what hackberry psyllid. They form what we call a nipple gall on there, and they always have these galls on them. It's really hard to find a leaf after about leaf out that doesn't have them on there. Uh, same reason with honey locusts as with the um, Kentucky coffee tree. They produce the seed pods, the long brown narrow ones. They can also be in a little bit of a curly cue. Uh, some people don't like that, but they do work fairly well. Lindens are getting really popular right now, but it's getting to the point where I'm wondering if we're planting too many of them. <laughs> What's that? We're getting over 10%. It's kind of been the go-to since the ash trees. People like the shape of them. Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of those going in uh, between. They're a good shade tree. They have a very nice natural shape. Uh, they do shed some smaller branches quite a bit, uh, so they are a little bit messy in that regard. Lots of people um, are going for the red maples. The more popular variety would be the autumn blaze because they like that fall color. But other good ones in our area, if you're willing to sacrifice a part of your lawn to heavy shade, Norway maples do do fairly well. My neighborhood, there are Norway maples everywhere in that neighborhood. So they are getting to be fairly popular. Sugar maple, if you can find one, it would be a good option as well. So they're not real popular. That's what I have coming this spring to add to my yard is a sugar maple. Then you get the, into the oaks if you're willing to deal with acorns in your yard. So my other tree that I'm getting started in my front yard is a bur oak. 
and that one I've gotten from a, a local tree just outside of town. It's progeny from that, so it's locally adapted. That's how I'm going with mine. But all these oaks uh, are good shade trees. That you're gonna have to be patient with them. It does take time. Northern pecan would be an, another option. I know people don't like black walnut because of the walnuts, but if you like feeding the squirrels and you don't want to go buy walnuts, it's a good option. Uh, the other thing with black walnut is you will have trouble growing stuff underneath it. They do put out a chemical called jugalone that interferes with a lot of broadleaf plant growth and development. Jugalone. Jugalone. Uh -huh. they, they hate those too because if you have a car anywhere near when the wind blows, the tail turns all over and I put four or five of these down last year because people said my car my car looks like it's going through a tail. Makes great beautiful wood, but yeah. But every other year they produce nuts, right? It can be every other year. They do go through uh, large and small years for production. Acorn or year oak trees typically do that as well. Yeah, and it might be the particular one you have, the, the genetics that it has. It's set for every other year, or the conditions in your growing environment for it. Yep. I don't believe so. I do not believe so. So it all takes two years to make nuts. No. But if it does, it sticks every year. It's like a clock. So it'll get a few in one year and then. No, it won't get any. Won't get any. Like it's a drought, and the next year there's nuts up there, and then the next year it's like, I don't have to pick up nuts this year. Okay. It's weird. I'm not. <laughs> So one of the other things that we're seeing is people don't want these huge shade trees anymore. They want shorter stuff, smaller stuff. And what you'll hear the foresters talk about is the miniaturization of U.S. forestry. See, you're nodding. You've heard that. Right, because the trees get so big, they're over everybody's house, and then they worry about the storms and stuff. So mm -hmm. So then you get into the smaller tree selection here. There's a lot of different things in here. Uh, <laughs> anything that reaches up to the power lines can be a problem, especially when you get ice and wind, or heavy, wet snow and wind. Yeah. Uh, if you're wanting to avoid anything like that, anything that holds leaves or needles through the winter, you're more likely to get weighed down and break with ice or heavy snow than something that sheds its leaves every year. It's actually against a lot of plant and silver maples in Columbus. I was not aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Now those you have separate male and female trees. Yeah. Yep. So if you if you plant one and you actually want it, you can actually after it's about four to five years old is when it'll start producing berries. It's a, it's a female. So you look for the little blue berries on it, and you start seeing those little blue berries on it, and you know it's a female, and you can lop her out, and try again with something else that might be a male. Might take you a few tries to get one, but that does happen in windbreaks quite a bit now. People will go through and cut out all the female ones and replant with red cedar and wait until they start producing berries. If they produce berries, they cut them out. And then, but what it also does is it stair steps their development of their trees so they don't have everything to climb at once. Because that's a lot what we're noticing right now. If you talk to the NRD, they do have windbreak renovation programs in place. 
to help with renovation because we planted them all at the same time. All the trees are the same age. They all start declining at the same time. Are, are there any ash trees that are able to resist it more? And then, and then yes, there are. There are? Yeah. It's coming up later. I will get to you on that one. What's that? And they don't get drilled. <laughs> So there's a lot of pieces in here you can pick up from, and then they even have a small deciduous tree under 20 foot list. So when you, if you do start looking for some of these, look at the tags, look at the growth zones on them. For the Norfolk area, I highly recommend getting zone four, even though on the USDA map, we are listed as a zone five. Zone five is further south. You're supposed to have slightly milder winters. And what my take on this is when they redid the zones about seven or eight years ago, it's based on average annual temperatures. Think about what we get. We get the extremes. So we still get the extreme cold, we still get the extreme heat, and we, can, we bounce back and forth. So I still recommend trying to get a zone four when you can on any plant that you know is going to get exposed to the elements in your yard. If you have something that's really protected, you might be able to get away with a zone five. I know of a few magnolia trees in Norfolk that are in protected areas that do just fine. One of them is on Norfolk Avenue, west of Walgreens and CVS, up on the north side of the road. If you drive past, let's see, give it another about five to six weeks. And that's, that'll be in bloom. So choose, um, and they, they do have an evergreen list. If you're going to pick evergreens, let's see what we've got here. They don't, good, they don't have them on here. Stay away from scotch pine and Austrian pine. Because those are catching pine wilt pretty readily. If you get a really stressed white pine, they can get pine wilt and decline from that as well. But a scotch pine can go from infection to dead in three to four months during the summer. Isn't there a beetle in Colorado? Oh, you're talking about mountain pine beetle? That one, that's a cyclical pest that comes and goes, and it is on its way down. So it's just one of those things. It's a natural cycle. Then they complain about the forest fires. You're talking about like, like a blue, we call it blue stain. Okay. The blue stain fungus, almost all of these wood boring insects carry a blue, a blue stain fungus, whether it's a different species or not from another one. But that's typical of wood boring insects to carry a blue stain fungus. It seems like even when I cut them out of people's yards, the next year, the next one decides it dies too. Like, you can't stop it. With pine wilt? Yeah, because all it takes is the beetle that carries it is native. The disease is native. So it hits these exotic pines, Scotch and Austrian pines, which are from Europe. And the beetle, when it comes out, will feed on small twigs of the pine tree. And that then releases chemicals from the tree that then signal these nematodes that are hanging out inside the breathing tubes of the beetle. And they'll plop out onto that branch hoping to make it inside that wound and then once they get in there then they start feeding and multiplying and they clog up the transport tissues of the tree. Can you spread that with chainsaw? Okay, say that again. Can you spread that fungus with a chainsaw? Can you spread pine wilt with a chainsaw? It's actually not a fungus. It's a small non-segmented word called a nematode. It's a nematode. Yep. And if you allow the equipment to dry out, it's usually not spreadable via that chainsaw if you let it dry out. Yeah, and now in the wood, it can take up to a year to get out of the wood. So when we do recommend, you can store the chipped wood. The idea is to chip the wood so you don't get the beetles. And then you can store that wood for a year and put it back around pines. The trick is, if you don't put it around pines, you don't have to worry about it. So if you're establishing a new grove using wood chips or mulch around the trees, you've got to be really careful. 
Just don't wound the trees. <laughs> yeah, you do have to be somewhat careful with that. Um, because of where I'm at, I use cedar wood chips because I know I've got termites in the area and I do not want to encourage the termites around my house and they don't like cedar wood chips. So they're not going to be in there feeding on the wood chips. I know we've gone way off, but perfectly. Good. So they do mention some trees for the collector. And here is the one that I'll show you a picture of a little bit later. Manchurian ash does have some tolerance slash resistance to emerald ash borer. But it's from the part of China where it's emerald ash borer is native. So it's used to being attacked by it. So any of these, if you're going to go for one of these, make sure you do a little bit of research behind them. Like, OK, right here, like over cup oak, avoid high pH soils. So do not put them in the Bel Air region. That would be a b very poor idea. So let's see if this will work. Where are we at on time? Oh, we're doing. I see a lot of lindens, not only American linden, but little leaf linden. They're all going in quite a bit. It's pretty popular. They're easy trees to get the shape that you want out of them and get, and they have a decent growth. So there you go. There's Manchurian ash. I told you we'd get to it. I have a picture. Um, so this one is highly resistant to attack um, because it's from the same region as I mentioned. And they are using it as a source of resistance genes with a breeding program now to see if they can breed some of that resistance into our native ashes. So what's going to happen is the same thing with elms. We'll see if those hybrid elms become a problem, if we have hybrid ash trees that become a problem. So here's your insecticide treatment approach. If you're inside the quarantine zone, yes, an annual treatment would be necessary to preserve uninfested ash trees. If you're outside the quarantine zone, don't treat unless you're within 15 miles of a known infestation area. So what is the treatment? Is it a intravenous a spray to the bar? There's a number of options, and they work with mixed results depending on the size of the tree. There are some basal drenches that you, the homeowner, can do that work up until you get to about a, I'm trying to remember, about a 20 inch diameter tree. Once you get to about 20 inches, you can't put on a high enough rate to get it up into the full amount of the tree. That's where you gotta then do a trunk injection. It's, those work far more effective. So this is our current area. So the pink counties are the quarantine zone. They've done a nice job for us of putting out the 15 mile radius around the known infestation areas. So here's Blair. So really our closest one is right here, Missouri Valley, Iowa. That's our closest infestation, really, because you it's a, just a hair further to get to Omaha. And I always had it for a little bit longer than we have. So I mentioned the gal that put it on Facebook. Now, if you think you have it, and I'm going to especially talk to you since you cut down a lot of trees. <laughs> if you think you have something, take it into the extension office. I would be a great initial resource to tell you whether or not you're in line with yes it is or no it's not. And then what I would do, if I think it's really close, I'm going to send it down to the diagnostic lab in Lincoln. From there, if they confirm it, they're going to send it off into the USDA lab. With the one in Omaha, that hit on Wednesday, they were stripping that tree on Monday. So Monday, they were out looking at it. Wednesday is when they made the statewide announcement. That's how fast they can move. Of course, it was close enough, they just drove it into Lincoln and then up. <clears throat> so um, they're going to go back to the site, collect more specimens, like I just mentioned. 
The Department of Ag will take the lead on preparations. So if you're part of this, please do not say anything until we get official confirmation and an official release because it has a lot of consequences for our nursery dealers, thing, places like Earl May, Baumgars, Menards, any place that's gonna sell nursery stock of any kind, it's gonna affect them if it's found in our area. So we need to make sure we get it right and get it right the first time. Okay, since we're running up right on time, if you want more information, go to the Nebraska Forest Service. That's where I got the map that shows the Nebraska quarantine zone with the 15 mile radiuses. They have a lot of information on Emerald Dashboard. You'll see EAB for an abbreviation a lot. And then the big national website is emeralddashboard.info. So those are the big ones that we go to for more information. That, I'm going to make the dismount and ask for questions. You guys did a good job of asking yeah. as we went through. So if this started over in China and they've had it for years and years, has it wiped out everything or new growth keeps coming and, and maybe they escape it for a while and then they get attacked and just... No, the native trees are somewhat resistant, so you don't get the large population buildup. Our ash trees? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They are native here. For Nebraska, you saw them a lot along the river systems where you had natural fire breaks. So a good example is if you go up to Pierce where Willow Creek and the North Fork of the Elkhorn come together, you get a natural double-sided wind break or fire break right there because both of those bodies of water are wide enough to break the initial prairie fires that we would have had before trees. And that's also one of the places we find termites. So we see a lot of termites where we had those areas because there would have been wood for them to feed on. So yes, termites are native to our area too. Great, well thank you very much, Wayne. It was very informative, mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Uh, if they have any other questions, they can catch you at the extension office. Yep. So Just not tomorrow. We're closed on Saturday and Sunday. Well, you'll be back tomorrow, though. Yes, I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, one. I don't what time. You told me one, so I'm hoping that's when I'm on. I don't know. <laughs> yes, and you're talking about uh, gardening for pollinators. Insects. But well, we're, we're broadening it. Okay. Did you put pollinators down? Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah, go on. And then I've got tickets for you guys, and we have.